This is the second of three videos in Module 1, DNA Discovery and Structure. In this video, the discovery and characterization of the DNA double helix, I'll talk a little bit about some of the early work that was done by early scientists trying to discover what DNA looked like and was shaped like without really totally understanding that it was a hereditary material. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, what we learned from their work. So a little bit before, so remember that Griffith's transformation principle studies were done in 1944. Um, so well before that, scientists already knew about DNA um, and were more interested in it as a chemical. Um, what is the chemical structure of DNA? And let's try to characterize all the different parts of the cell. And so while all of this was, um, so while this sort of set some of the foundation for trying to discover what was the hereditary material, um, these experiments were more interested in what is the structure of DNA. And so this work began with Meischer in 1868, um, who discovered that genetic material, which he called nuclein, is housed in the nucleus of the cells. And so he was tasked with trying to determine the chemical composition of that genetic material. He um, worked in a hospital and basically went from room to room collecting used band-aids and collecting all of the blood from those band-aids to isolate large amounts of nuclein, as he called it. Um, he then subjected it to multiple different chemical analyses and found out that it was rich in phosphate, um, rich in nitrogen, and had a carbohydrate, but couldn't really link all the different pieces together. In 1885, Kossel discovered that DNA contains four different types of nitrogenous bases, which is pictured here in the pink. Um, and so he started characterizing adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. He missed out on characterizing uracil, which is the nitrogenous base found only in RNA. Levine in 1905 started to look at the work of Meischer and Kossel and link together a picture of what a nucleotide looks like, a nucleotide being the basic building block of DNA. So he described that a nucleotide consisted of a carbohydrate base, and they're all the same for every nucleotide in DNA, a phosphate group, which linked together the sugar bases, and then a nitrogenous base, which distinguished each of the four building blocks of DNA. Edwin Shargaff, uh, Erwin Shargaff, I'm sorry, in 1955, started to describe some of the characteristics of the DNA double helix. And so moving beyond the nucleotide and trying to stitch them together, what does DNA look like when all the nucleotides are stitched together? And so Shargaff started to examine DNA a little bit more closely after the work of Griffith um, was done, and then alongside Avery McCloy and McCarty, who discovered that DNA was the more important hereditary material, or was the hereditary material. And so here, Erwin Shargaff created some rules based on his chemical analysis of the DNA double helix. He found that the amount of adenine was always equal to the amount of thymine, or A's always equal to the amount of T's, and the amount of cytosine was always equal to the amount of guanine, so C's always equal to the amount of G's. And so he also, so he noticed this, and so that within a molecule of DNA, wherever there was an A, there must also be a T, and wherever there was a C, there must also be a G. And so what he was sort of getting at without really describing fully was base pairing, complementary base pairing between two strands of DNA. He also noticed that the base composition, so the percent of AT pairs and GC pairs, differed depending on the species. And so here we see some of what he was showing was that, um, so here we see AT here in humans, there's 30% of human DNA is made up of A, 30% is made up of T, 19.5% is made up of G and 19.5% is made up of C. But when you look at other organisms like E. coli or rats, those ratios vary and change depending on the organism. And so um, base composition is distinct between different uh, species, but A is always equal T's and G always equal C's regardless of how, what percent G, C or A, T an organism is. We now know that this is linked to the type of environment organisms tend to live in. And so, for example, organisms that live in very cold temperatures tend to have more AT pairs, 
whereas organisms that live in very warm temperatures tend to have more GC pairs. And I'll come back to this point when I talk about why. Okay, so in taking all of this information, um, Watson and Crick and Franklin, Rosalind Franklin, together um, characterized what the DNA double helix looks like. And so Rosalind Franklis was a biochemist. She did this through the use of X-ray diffraction. And then Watson and Crick used um, past published data by Meischer, Kossel, and Levine, and Shargaff, and then used some lecture information that Franklin delivered in one of her lectures to create a ball and stick model of what the DNA double helix looked like. And so first I'm going to talk about what Rosalind Franklin did, and then I'll talk about the different um, components of the DNA double helix that were described and characterized by Watson and Crick. And so this is a little bit of like biology history drama. Um, it was, uh, so Watson and Crick were the ones who received credit and the Nobel Prize for discovering the 3D structure of DNA, but they used um, experimental information that was not yet published by Rosalind Franklin to do so. She was describing it in one of her lectures and Watson and Crick were um, in attendance at one of her lectures. Um, and they so, but they did use that information as a basis to describe the DNA double helix and published before Rosalind Franklin had a chance to. And so um, she was never recognized for her work during her life, um, but she has, she was recognized posthumously after her death for an equal contributor in discovering the 3D structure of DNA. And she is today recognized as an equal contributor to this, to this work. And so what did she do? What was her work? Okay, so Franklin, Rosalind Franklin, used a technique called X-ray crystallography or X-ray diffraction. What this is is um, she has a source of X-rays that she, and then like a sub, like a, a surface that she points it on. And so she she was really interested in the structure of different biological molecules. So she was a biochemist, um, and she was interested in things like helical proteins or um, beta sheet proteins and what um, lipids looked like, what, what sugars looked like. And so she took a lot of these different molecules, different biological molecules, bombarded them with x-rays, and then those x-rays would bounce off in a repeatable pattern. Um, a photographic plate took a picture of what that pattern was, the diffraction pattern of those x-rays. And from that pattern, she was able to determine what the structure was of the compound sitting on the surface. And so she looked at a lot of alpha helices and she also looked at DNA. And what she noticed was that the diffraction pattern of DNA very closely matched the diffraction pattern of proteins that took on a helix structure. And what she also noticed was that the helix was a little bit uneven. Um, and so what that means is the terms were not all perfectly um, symmetrical. And she was able to determine that by measuring the distance across these black hash marks or above and below um, or below these two hash marks here. And so she was able to measure the exact amount of nucleotides within each term and the exact spacing of nucleotides between two strands of a double helix. So she was really able to describe a lot of the structure and a lot of the different components that I'm about to talk about. Um, and again, um, she was she she used this experimental approach, and so um, Watson and Crick were also using diffraction methods to do this, but they were using DNA in its dehydrated form. Uh, Rosalind Franklin, as a biochemist, recognized that um, cellular components don't ever exist in a dehydrated form; they're always bathed in the aqueous solution of the inside of the cell. We are aqueous creatures. And so she looked at DNA when it was in its hydrated form and was therefore able to describe the true structure of DNA. And so what did all three of them together work towards to describe? And so first, let's talk about nucleotides. All nucleotides contain one phosphate group, which is pictured here. That phosphate group is linked to the five prime carbon on a sugar base. In DNA, that sugar base is deoxyribose. In RNA, that sugar base is ribose. And so we call DNA nucleotides deoxyribonucleotides, and we call RNA nucleotides ribonucleotides. <clears throat> the only difference between ribose and deoxyribose is the presence of an OH group at the two prime carbon. 
that OH group is missing at the two prime carbon in a deoxyribose, which hence its name. We label the carbons in these sugar rings in a clockwise fashion, starting here. So this is the one prime carbon, two, three, four, and five. And each of these carbons, with the exception of the fourth prime carbon, has a special significance when we look at the, um, the double helix. So I'll come back to that. So again, linked to the five prime carbon is a phosphate group on every nucleotide. Linked to the one prime carbon on every nucleotide is a nitrogenous base. There are two different types of nitrogenous bases that are distinguished based on the structure of their ring. Purines have two ring structures, and the different purines are adenine and guanine. They are very, very similar structurally. Look, there's only really two, there's only these differences here. There's an O double bond O at this, at this carbon, whereas here there's an, um, a nitrogen group, and here, um, there's a nitrogen group on guanine that's missing in adenine, but otherwise they're exactly the same. They're really, really similar structurally. The other type of nitrogenous base are pyrimidine, and they are characterized by having only a single ring structure. There are three types of pyrimidines, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Thymine is only present in DNA, and, and DNA lacks uracil. Uracil is only present in RNA, and RNA lacks thiamine. And so in an RNA molecule, uracil replaces the thiamine. So stitching them all together, this is what a nucleotide looks like. This is an adenine nucleotide. So this is a deoxyadenosine monophosphate, meaning it's by itself, it's not linked up in a double helix. Here's the five prime carbon linked to a phosphate group. Here's the one prime carbon linked to its nitrogenous base. Note the lack of an OH group at the two prime carbon. This is a deoxyribose base. And then we have very similar structures for each of the other three remaining nucleotides, guanine, thiamine, and cytosine. Now let's take a look at the secondary structure of DNA, which is the double helix. There are some structural components to really take note of, and this is what Rosalind Franklin was able to describe with her DNA diffraction studies and what Watson and Crick were able to synthesize based on all of the other previous studies plus Rosalind Franklin's data. So here we have the nucleotide. Here's the nucleotide. This is a thymine nucleotide. And you'll notice, well, let's actually go back to this nucleotide. So here's everything all linked up. Here's the ribose sugar. Linked to the five prime carbon is the phosphate group. Linked to the one prime carbon is the nitrogenous base. DNA, the DNA double helix has two strands. This is one strand, and this is the other strand, held together by hydrogen bonds in the center. These strands run in opposite directions, which means that over on this strand, we have the five prime carbon and the phosphate group going in this five prime to three prime direction. On this strand, we have the opposite is true. So the five prime phosphate group is over on this end as opposed to on this end. And so they run in opposite directions. This is referred to anti-parallel. The bases or the two strands are held together by a phosphate sugar backbone, but the, or on their own. So the single strand is held together by these covalent bonds on the backbone, but the two strands are held together by non-covalent base pairing in the center. This is referred to as complementary base pairing and explains what Shargaff was able to see, that the amount of A's always equal the amount of T's and the amount of G's always equal the amount of C's. This is because this is how the structure is held together in the center by hydrogen bonds. Note that A's and T's pairs are held together by two hydrogen bonds and GC pairs are held together by three hydrogen bonds. This is linked to um, an adaptation to their environment. And so very hot organisms living in very hot environments, like organisms living in deep sea thermal vents or in the um, geysers in Yosemite National Park where there's hot springs and things like that, organisms that live in those environments tend to have more GC pairs. So they tend to be 70 to 72% GC rich. And that is because there's more hydrogen bonds between a GC pair. And so without that additional hydrogen bonding, the DNA double helix in those organisms would fall apart and denature. Because there's more hydrogen bonds in their cores, they don't fall apart. 
Phosphodiester linkages are covalent bonds that hold together the single-stranded backbone. And so you're able in your cell, when DNA replicates, you're able to pull apart the two single strands and create a new strand using one of these strands as a template. But we are not able to pull apart the different nucleotides that exist in one strand because that is held together by a very strong covalent bond. The phosphodiester connection connects the five prime phosphate and to a neighboring three prime OH group. I'm sorry, the three prime group found here. Yeah, OH group. And as I noted before, AT pairs have two hydrogen bonds, whereas GC pairs have three hydrogen bonds. When we look at the secondary structure of RNA, <clears throat> it is only a single polynucleotide strand. It's not a double-stranded molecule like DNA is. This is mostly because this of the presence of this OH at the two prime carbon. So let's go back to the DNA. This two prime carbon, note that it's just a hydrogen bond. But when we add an OH in there, that extra oxygen creates too much steric hindrance for a double-stranded RNA um, helix to take form. And so with that extra OH in here, that would destabilize these hydrogen bonds in the core. And so because that OH has presence in an RNA molecule, these um, bases are not able to hold on to their hydrogen bonds for very long periods of time. They can do so for very short periods of time, but not long periods of time. Um, their backbone is also connected by a phosphodiester bond, um, and it contains sugar bases, but ribose instead of deoxyribose. Remember what I said about Rosalind Franklin investigating DNA in its hydrated form in the presence of water. Um, this is the form that she was examining was the B form of DNA. And remember, I said the helix was not even. There's some asymmetry to it. That asymmetry comes in the form of a major groove and a minor groove. And so what happens is when RNA is hydrated in its natural form, um, the helix is turning in this way. So it's a um, it's turning this 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 is the direction of the helix here. Um, so it's a right-handed helix. It's turning toward the right, and that's hard to that's hard to see with this image, but that's the direction. That's a right-handed helix, and because of the way the um, the core lines up, we have large spaces between this turn and a much smaller space between this turn, and they alternate. So we have a big space here between these two turns, a small space, a bigger space, a smaller space, and so on. And so that big space is called the major groove. And that smaller space is called the minor groove. In its dehydrated form, which is what Watson and Crick were looking at, they saw a more symmetrical type of diffraction pattern um, called the A form, where there's really no difference between the major and minor groove. The differences between them, the spaces, are um, less obvious. And so they were having trouble recreating DNA in a ball and stick model because they weren't able to get it to line up properly based on the other components of nucleotides that they were looking at. <clears throat> this is because they were looking at it in its dehydrated form, which does not exist naturally in our bodies. What neither of them were able to detect was the Z form of DNA, in which the direction of the helix is turned back in, into its opposite side. So it's a left-handed helix instead of a right-handed helix. Um, see how it's turning to the left instead of to the right here in this image. Um, the Z form of DNA is a transient form. It's, it's known to be um, linked to different... Um, different rates of expression. And so this exists only in very short periods of time under very specific conditions. So remember that all three, all, all of these different components of the DNA double helix sort of satisfy these key characteristics that were described um, in the first video, where genetic material must contain complex information. Right, DNA is composed up of four different nucleotides, and when used in different combinations, um, can represent a wide variety of different, um, a, a, a wide variety of blueprints, right? If you can mix and match those four bases in many different ways to create different complex molecules. Genetic material must replicate faithfully. The way that DNA is set up is that um, during replication, the information contained within a single strand is maintained. And so when we pull off this strand and we're left with a single one, we can recreate the single one faithfully through complementary base pairing, right? There will always be an A opposite this T. Um, 
and the fact that we don't disrupt the order of the nucleotides on a single strand. That order is maintained. And so DNA can replicate faithfully. Genetic material must encode the phenotype. And so um, this is what Griffith, Avery, McCloyd, and McCarty were able to show that the genetic material DNA was able to control what the cell looked like. And then genetic material must have the capacity to vary. This was not really described too much by the scientists that I mentioned already, but was sort of described by other later scientists once they started to apply what Charles Darwin was able to describe in his theory of evolution.